Morning, my name is Tyler Johnson. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, we are in a series in the book of Proverbs called Wisdom in Dizzying Times. This is going to sound weird, but I'm actually going to ask you to turn to the book of James chapter 4, which is actually the longest section of scripture we'll be in. We're going to go through eight different Proverbs um, re revolving around this idea of contentiousness, quarreling, strife, fighting, and underneath it, anger. But the longest section we'll be in is James chapter 4. So as you're turning there, prior to us praying, I just want to remind you of something or make you aware of something that you may not know. Um, when you come to participate, especially at church, at worship, you have a job to do as much as I have a job to do. There are leaders in the church and writers who lament that in Western culture, everything has been turned into a commodity. So if you don't know what that means, it just means everything is out there to be consumed. And how that's been brought into the church is they'll say the church now is nothing but a purveyor, a distributor of religious goods and services to be consumed. And so it puts the consumer in the position of the power is they evaluate everything um, up on stage. God doesn't allow us to do that. The book of James says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of it. So your job is consistently to hear the voice of God speak and bring it into application. We're in the book of Proverbs, and the Proverbs is all about wisdom that comes from knowing God is God and doing what he says. That the life and health and these promises of Proverbs don't come about unless you actually put these into practice, which is the display of faith. So as we pray today, uh, I'm going to give you four things to pray through anytime you engage the Word of God, um, whether that's sitting under a sermon on everything from live to YouTube to a podcast or you engaging in your daily Bible study. It's really simple. You pray to God, God, open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart, and then help me to do what you say. That's the four. Open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart, and help me to do what you're telling me to do. So let's pray that. Father, we come before you, and you're a living God, and you're a relational God, and you are here as we have sung in these songs. We pray, uh, Father, that you would open our eyes, that you'd open our ears, that you'd open our hearts, and God, you'd help us to do that which you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wisdom in dizzying times. We can all agree that we live in dizzying times. Dizzying, you think about the image of a boxer being jabbed and taken off of his step, kind of looking around, what do I make of all of this? But dizzying times are nothing new. Your times may feel confusing or dizzying in your own home, in your own heart, in the community you're in, at the world at large. Human beings have always needed wisdom. Times are dizzying and confusing because things are not lined up the way God intended them to be lined up in the beginning, right? Sin is real. It creates confusion. That's where the book of Proverbs comes in. And the foundation of the book of Proverbs is a verse in Proverbs 9.10 that says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One brings understanding. When you're sitting in a chaotic moment, when you're sitting in a confusing moment, you just want to know, what's the next step? Give me understanding. Praying, Lord, help me know what I'm supposed to do next. The fear of God who spoke the world into existence, who holds the world together by the word of his power, who in him everything holds together. Proverbs is saying God is reality. And if you live according to reality, according to God's ways through his word, you will gain understanding. You will be wise. Life is not most of the time found in the black and white. Meaning it's not just the easy stuff. This is obvious. I do this and do that. Life gets hard in all the other stuff where you go, I'm not certain what to do. I don't know how to respond. 
I don't know what decision to make. That's where Proverbs comes in as its whole, delivering for us wisdom to know what to do in the moment, being guided by the living and true God. Here's the other thing Proverbs says, is that God is reality, live according to his word and his ways. If you don't, you'll be dashed against the rocks of reality. That's what, all over it. You will be dashed against the rocks of reality who is God. There is a way God has ordered the world to function according to him. That when we live in line with that, we gain more understanding. The theme today revolves around these two Proverbs. Proverbs 26, 21, you don't need to put these up yet. And Proverbs 21, 19, which speak about a contentious man and a contentious woman. Or a quarrelsome man and a quarrelsome woman. Fighters. Under that is anger. And I think oftentimes as Christians, we like to categorize anger just in the bad category. That's not true. We're not going to have a time this morning to nuance the difference between good and bad anger. But I want you to really understand, there is good anger. You can't just say anger is all bad because God got angry. And there's passages, even in the book of Ephesians, that will speak about be angry but don't sin. Right? And it's this righteous anger. Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after that which is right, after righteousness and justice, which means you get mad at things that aren't right and things that are unjust. There's a great book, if you're interested in this, called Good and Angry by a man named David Powlison, P-O-W-L-I-S-O-N. I'd recommend anything that he writes, but this book's really good. It's called Good and Angry, In Contrast to Bad and Angry. The subtitle's Redeeming Anger, Irritation, Complaining, and Bitterness. And in this book, he says this. This book isn't about solving the anger problem, nor will this message be. He says, anger is not a problem to solve. It's a human capacity, like sex, happiness, and sorrow. It's a complex human response to a complex world. So stop for a minute and just say this. Anger is a complex human response to a complex world. To a reality that the world we live in is good because God made it and it's sinful because we didn't take God at his word and we rebelled. It's a complex human response to a complex world. And like all human capacities and responses, it sometimes works well, but too often goes bad. We're going to talk about the too often goes bad part. The part that leads to fighting and quarreling and strife. In real life, bad anger disintegrates families. It incinerates marriages. It energizes gossip and slander. Bad anger is what leads to the gunning down of people that are just trying to attend a concert. It divides churches. It turns friends into enemies. It erupts into road rage. Pallison says, it's the stuff of every form of grievance and bitterness. Anger is the basic DNA of complaining, the basic DNA of brooding, the basic DNA of irritability and bickering. Now, when you hear the phrase anger, what image or experience comes up in your mind? This is where I'm giving you the opportunity to engage the message, your part. What image or experience comes up in your mind when you hear the phrase, she is angry? What image or experience comes up in your mind when you hear the phrase, he is angry? Same question, image or experience that comes to your mind when you hear the phrase, I am angry. Here's the reality. When you come before the word of God, you have to bring the real stuff, the stuff you really feel. Because the only you that God can change is the real you. No matter who you are sitting in this room, whether you deeply believe, you're somewhat confused about your belief, or you say you don't believe at all, my sense is you're here for some reason. And I think everybody in this room would at least say, if there's a God, I want to encounter him. The only encounter God can have with you is the real you. So asking this question of what image or experience or feelings come to your mind when you hear she's angry, he's angry, I'm angry, or what do you feel when you come upon an angry environment is very important as we move into this. I'm going to read eight passages. They're going to come on the screen from the Proverbs about strife and quarreling. The word quarreling just means fighting. 
I want to read them almost with no commentary, maybe very little, just an explanation. And just allow you to sit with them. Here's something that's very important with the Proverbs. If you go at the Proverbs and you read only one verse, here's a proverbial statement, and you go, that's true, forever true. The Proverbs themselves will screw you up for this reason. You'll keep reading and read another proverb that sounds exactly the opposite of what you've just read. The Proverbs were meant to be read comprehensively, coherently, from kind of beginning to end as a whole. And they were meant to be read comprehensively and in community, communally. So a lot of commentators will say that this is likely a group of young people, young men, sitting under the guidance of a mentor, and they're seeking to understand wisdom in the midst of the real world. Wisdom when in sometimes that's obvious I'm supposed to do that, but at other times I'm supposed to do something very different. And you gain wisdom through the comprehensive, cohesive look at Proverbs and to read it communally. That said, I want to read eight passages about this topic so that we get kind of a wholesale perspective of what the Proverbs are giving us about wisdom in dizzying times as it relates to anger self-control and fighting, okay? So let's start. The first two are the two we had on the docket to teach. Proverbs 26, 21. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Now you're sitting in this room and if you know a man that's just a fighter, you go, yeah, as a charcoal to hot embers, wood to fire. A quarrelsome man is to kindling strife. Like he brings about quarrels. He brings about fights. He brings about strife. Now the Proverbs are good not to speak only to men. Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. There are other people biting their tongue like, amen, Right? <laughs> Yes, but it's saying it's better. Like this is dangerous business. Proverbs 15, 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 16, 32. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Here's another translation. Better is a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. Proverbs 30, 33. For pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. I love the imagery of the Bible. Proverbs 20, verse 3. It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. Another translation. It is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Here's something you have to understand about the Proverbs. The Proverbs say... Fools fight. Quarreling is foolish. Stirring strife is done by the fool, not the wise. Proverbs 13, verse 10. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Here's what insolence means. Wherever there's strife, there's pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 29, 11. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Another translation, fools give full vent to, to their rage. Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. We live in a time that gives full vent to its rage. 
We live in a time where everybody seems to be quick to speak and slow to listen. When God says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. We live in a time, as Tom Schrader, the founding pastor of this church says, where everything's about fighting even Food Network. It's cupcake wars. (laughs) And chopped. And the people who get chopped It's designed so that they argue with the judges and tell how everybody else is bad. Sports shows are designed where it's Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless and it's designed to create a quarrel. We live in a time where if you can create strife and stir strife and create a fight, you're more likely to get elected than if you don't. Folks, you've got to see that affects you and it affects me and it affects us. There's a writer from the journal Gawker, and he says this, jokes are complicated and context is hard. Jokes are complicated. Just recently, Woody Allen says, we live in a time that you can't even do comedy anymore. You say something, everybody wants to fight about it. Everybody's thin-skinned. Everybody's offended by something. You Comics can't even exist in this context. This writer says, jokes are complicated. And then he says this, context is hard. Here's what he's saying. It's really hard to sit down and go, let me see this from your perspective. He says, context is hard. The next phrase he uses is, rage is easy. Folks, it's simple to be enraged and to vent your rage. And it's foolish, the Proverbs say. Context is hard. Being slow to speak and quick to listen is hard. That's context. Being fast to speak and slow to listen is easy. That's absolutely simple. He says jokes are complicated, context is hard, rage is easy. And then he says this, rage is easy and it creates traffic. We live in a context where rage and quarreling create traffic. And you and I are affected by it. Culture shapes us knowingly and unknowingly. Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. This world, Tom would always use the Phillips translation, seeks to press you into its mold and make you into a fighter. Make you into a quarreler. Tom also says, I'm quoting him a lot this morning, everybody loves to go to NASCAR because everybody wants to see a wreck. That's not of God. God says, don't be conformed to the world when it comes to quarreling, fighting, and anger. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's what that means. We've got to be the kind of people that when we feel rage build up within us or when we come at it, upon it, even though it's outside of us, we step back and go, I'm not going to be conformed to the world. What does God think of this? I remember when we were doing that study on Proverbs and this statement of rage is foolish. Quarreling and fighting lead to horrific places. Quieting my lips, being slow to listen is wisdom. Right? We have to be able to step back and assess it according to the ways and to the word of God. We must ask these really pragmatic questions like, does tit for tat really work? I was sitting with a woman, an older woman that had been married about 30 years and started talking to her about the bickering in her marriage and the consistent fighting. And I said, what is that, you know, like? Like, she's like, well, he's so selfish and so self-absorbed and he's so entitled and he's always asking for me to do things. I'm like, well, what do you do in those situations? I tell him he's a slug. I tell him to get it for himself. I tell them it's ridiculous and we've lived like this forever. And so my next statement was, well, how's that worked out for you for the last 30 years, right? Like, it's like in my house, right? These moments where the kids are yelling, people are screaming and I just scream louder. Stop screaming, right? And it's amazing. Like they all line up behind me. They're like, oh, wise one, let us do what you say. Lead us into the promised land, right? That's never what happens, ever, right? Right? Or you sit with your spouse and they bring something to you and you just fight back. No, you're the dumb one. It always works, right? It never works. 
Like whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, it doesn't work. Fighting and quarreling not only doesn't work, it destroys your soul. It exposes in front of your face, and yet we consistently do it, the foolishness of the tactic. We must not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. So here's the question. Why do we get angry? Whether you're reading a social media post, whether you're listening to your child, whether you're at work and somebody's smacking their gum and chewing out loud, or whether you didn't get the deal done, or whether you're looking at your life and you just get angry that leads to these arguments. What is it that actually causes anger and more importantly for this message, causes fights and quarreling? James, who was a Jew, the brother of Jesus, read the Proverbs over and over and over again. He listened to his brother spout out proverbial wisdom. Jesus himself would speak the Proverbs, right? Remember, God spoke the Proverbs through the writers of the Proverbs, mostly Solomon himself. James has stood in these. And he's bringing this reality to life as he's seeking to teach these churches in James chapter 4. And he starts in verse 1 and he says this, What causes quarrels and fights among you? This is the question. Like if we just step up, why are we fighting? Right? Whether you look at our country and go, why are we all fighting? Or you look at your workplace, why are we fighting? Or you look at your home, why are we fighting? Or you look inside yourself, the wrestles and fights with this. What causes quarrels and fights amongst you? Now he asks a rhetorical question that the answer is yes. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Now that word passions is translated also desires. And James, just like his brother Jesus, is getting to the heart of the matter, not just metaphorically heart of the matter, but literally to the heart. Jesus constantly through his teaching would say things to his hearers and then drive it back to you into your heart. Jesus never allowed people to go, oh yeah, those people, right? You've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I tell you, if you hate someone, you've committed murder already. I tell you that if you say you fool, the words raka, they say, you're liable to the hellfire, right? Every time I read that in the Sermon on the Mount, if you say you fool, like if in your head you go, you fool, you're liable to the hellfire. I'm going, I'm going to burn <laughs> because I say you fool a lot inside my head about situations and people. He's getting to the heart of the matter. Tyler, why do you say that? Is it not that your passions and desires are at war within you? He gets to the heart of the matter. This is Jesus consistently is going at the heart. Matthew 15, 19. For out of the heart comes your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, all evil, vile practices. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, and false testimony and slander. It's a heart issue. Now that sounds very kind of big, conceptual, out there. Like what does that actually mean? So now James goes, I'm going to get even a little more detailed. Basically what he's saying is I'm going to slice and dice you, right? What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this? Your passions are at war. Your desires, what you want. Now he comes up in verse two. You desire and you don't have, so you murder your passions. You fight and quarrel because you have desires. You want something. And here's where he goes, that you're not getting. That's why you fight. Now pause a minute. Man, that's kind of true. Like, what do I want? What are the things that make me angry? Sometimes it's just the mundane things, right? Things like this. This is a clip from uh, the show Family Guy. Mom, 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 mommy, 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 mama, 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 ma, 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 mom, mom. Mom, mom, mommy, mommy, mama, mama, mama. What? Hi. <laughs> How true is that, right? I love the beginning of it. That one cut it short. The beginning of it, he uses her first name. He's like, Lois, 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 mom, mom, mommy, mama. Right? So there are these moments where you go, what do I want as a mom? I want peace and quiet. Can I just sit in my room 
or in the bathroom for God's sake and you not bother me. Right? Or to a dad, the kid just pulling your legs, dad, 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 right? Like, here's what I want. Give me peace. Now, is peace such a bad thing? Lord, is peace such a bad thing? And God goes, no, it's not. But there's this word in the Bible that means over-desire. I just, I like saying it. That's why I'm going to say it. It's this Greek word called epithumia. And it means over-desire. It's saying, listen, a desire for peace and calm is not wrong. Husbands, desire for respect is not wrong. Ephesians 5, in fact, instructs your wives to give you respect. Respect from your children, it's not wrong. Wives, this aspiration to be loved by your husbands is not wrong. Desire to be respected in the workplace isn't wrong. Desire to be treated justly is not wrong. But there's these moments, go back to James, verse 2. What causes fights and quarrels amongst us is because we desire something that we don't have, so now we go, you don't give it to me? We over-desire a good thing. This is one way Paul defines sin in Romans chapter 1 as we begin to worship and serve the created thing rather than the creator who's forever to be praised. What are the things that make us mad? Sometimes it's the mundane stuff, right? This, the person smacking their gum or chewing with their mouth open and, you, and rage comes up in you. Like, what do you want? I just want to live without hearing smacking food in my ear, right? And you literally, everything within you, the seedbed of like, I could absolutely give a double punch, wham, wham, right to that person. Like, shut your mouth. <laughs> Eat the food and shut your mouth. It's, but what I want is being over-desired. Here's another thing. You get mad at life. We get mad at life. This didn't go the way it was supposed to go. There's a shirt company that does these shirts called Wicked Apparel, and there's one that was just sent to me recently and said, well, that didn't go as planned. Hashtag my life. <laughs> right? And there are these realities of our lives that we get angry about. It's not supposed to be like this. Right? And we're very angry. There's something we wanted that we didn't get, and the result is we're going to fight about it. We're now going to brawl. You don't give me what, you, what I want. We're now going to brawl. Now, let me just ask you this question to step back. Does brawling get you what you want? You may go, eh, sometimes, right? Not, not really. This is true. I want you to know this. The word of God is true because it's the word of God. It's true interpersonally and it's true communally, and it's true nationally. One of the biggest problems I feel like with so many Christians is we so privatize or turn things into like hallmark statements, those are nice, and we want them as bumper stickers, and we want to write them and put them on our mirror, but we too seldom believe them to the point of doing them. This is true in every situation. Evaluate it. What causes fights and quarrels? Somebody wants something they're not getting, so they're willing to kill to get it. Our homes, our hearts, our countries, our world is horrific because of this truth. Now, he goes on and he says this. So you murder, you cover it and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Pause there and let's just go back real quick to that. You do not have because you do not ask. Now, Let's just start by saying this. One simple point of what we should be doing is praying. The book of Philippians, be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Prayer is medication for quarrels and fights. Prayer is medication for bad anger. You don't have because you don't ask. Now, James knows that so many of you are going to go, but I have asked. So here's what he says. Oh, you ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Here's simply what he's saying. It's all about you. This is what Proverbs 13.10 said about quarreling and about fighting. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice, who slow down and are slow to speak and quick to listen. 
You don't ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. St. Augustine, who's a smart guy, he's like a little bit smarter than me, maybe a little bit. He's very smart. He's way smarter than all of you, I promise you. Way smarter. A little bit than me, way smarter than you. <laughs> Augustine says this, that sin, I love this image, and I think it's so accurate to what the Bible's saying, is a radical curvature inward. And he designs that because when Adam and Eve in pride say God's word is not the wisest word and they trust themselves, the first thing that happens to them is they notice that they're naked. Their eyes turn inward. And Augustine says that's where chaos ensues. That we were designed by God to have our eyes towards him for his glory to others in love. To glorify God by loving other people. When you ask, you ask for your own gain, for your own good. You ask in self-absorbed ways, not in loving ways. That's what causes fights and quarrels. Simple term, we're selfish. If they're selfish and I'm selfish, fights, murder, wars ensue. Now here's what I love about James. He goes on and now you go, well, okay, so what do we do? What do we do with our anger? He says, verse four, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Stay on this one right here. I'll just go back one, sorry about that. We just sang a song that said, he is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. Now let's state the obvious. There's a ton of you in this room who hate that song. <laughs> Meaning you're like, what does this mean? Like, he's a hurricane, I'm a tree, I'm not a tree, right? You literalists. Okay, it's art, folks, it's imagery. <laughs> Here's the image. The first statement is this, he is jealous for you. Listen to me in this. You seek after what you want to the point of killing people because you believe nobody's after your good like you are. You're wrong. God's more committed to your good. God's more committed to you getting life to the full than you have ever thought or attempted at being committed to. He is jealous. You are his and he is after you to the point of sending his son to gain you back. Do you suppose it's to know scripture that he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made in all of us? He is jealous for me. His love's like a hurricane. I'm like a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. Here's the next statement. He gives more grace, verse six. But he gives more grace. I love that statement. Because we're sitting in this room and you hear those Proverbs read and there are tons of us in this room that go, I am a total slug. What do I do now? Like I am angry, but he gives more grace. He gives grace upon grace upon grace. But there is a condition. He doesn't give grace to everybody. He opposes the proud. If you're in here right now and I go, but he gives grace and everything within you is like, yes, but they're wrong. I'm right, they're wrong, I'm smart, they're stupid, I know, they're foolish, you are the proud. Now, to everybody else in this room, if you sit here and go, yeah, I know I need his grace, but I don't really think I'm proud, you're proud, right? <laughs> the fact that you said you're not proud means you're proud. Now, here is the reality. What do we do with our anger? God shows more grace but he opposes the proud. I gotta be honest with you, just standing up here. If you're proud, I honestly somewhat want you to leave for this reason. I'm scared to death to be under the thumb of God. I don't want God to oppose us as a church. I wanna receive God's grace. I want him to lift his face upon us. The people of God in their pursuit of God, in their humility, always praise Pray, God, bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace. But you want to know the one to whom God looks, Isaiah says? He looks at those who are humble 
and contrite in spirit and who tremble at his word. He opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, let me say this. Humility is scary like crazy. It's deeply vulnerable. This is a new hot word, right? It's deeply vulnerable. Like it's bringing the real you before the real God in faith, trusting you're really good. You really have my best interest in mind. It's the faith to say, I actually believe you're jealous for me, that you actually are more committed to my good than I am to my own. This statement that it, we are the ones to take the initiative to make a relationship right that has been wronged. No matter what the situation, the responsibility lands upon you in humility to own the stuff that you can own and to pray to God where I don't see that it's my junk, show me that it's my junk. That's humility. But God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He then says this, submit yourselves therefore to God. Here's what that means. Take God at his word, believe it, and begin to do it. Pray, God, open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart. Help me to do what you say. You're God, I'm not. No one's good but God alone. I trust you. And where I don't trust, I say, like the man in the Gospels, I do believe, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Submit to God. Take him at his word. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. That's where wisdom comes. Resist the devil. The devil who's the author of pride. Who C.S. Lewis said it was through pride that Lucifer became the devil. Resist the devil. When you sit in a culture where quarrels and fights win the day, they gain the traffic, they get people elected, people think it's great to win a battle, remember the words in 2 Timothy 2, 22 through 26 that it says, avoid foolish quarrels. Resist the devil, same phrase, and he will flee from you. Then he says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Trust me in this, draw near near to God and he will draw near to you. And then he basically says, repent. Here's the last thing I want to say and it's a story. I have a friend of mine uh, who's done extraordinary work in Iraq right around ISIS. So where all of the relief and development agencies will sit on the edges but they won't go into the militarized zone. This guy's developed an organization saying, listen, at the end of the day, we're going to take Jesus at his word or we're not, like, which says even love your enemies and love in hard situations. So he posted on social media um, just within the last year, they were right at the, the heart of the fight in Fallujah. There's bombs going. I mean, it's nuts. Like when you watch this, you're like, you're a crazy person, right? And it's all driven by going, I'm just going to take Jesus at his word. We're going to take Jesus at his word. And he wrote this post where he writes the whole thing. He has some videos on there. There's bombs going on them around him. And then the last line he writes in the whole thing is, the world is scary as hell. Love anyway. And it's become this hashtag now on social media. And they just sent me a shirt. I have a buddy of mine working for him now. And it just says, love anyway. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Submitting to God and taking him at his word. This reality of love your neighbor as yourself is the antidote to fighting and quarreling. So some of you are living in a workplace, you're living in a home, you're in the midst of a marriage, you're in the midst of a family, you're in the midst of a situation that is scary as hell. And I don't say that to be provocative, I mean literally, it feels like horror, hell. Love anyway. Submit to God. Trust him. Ask questions about the desires and passions that are within you. Seek God for wisdom. Believe him and he will deliver in ways you never thought or imagined. This is Paul's promise. He will do exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything we could ask or think if we approach him in simple faith and go to all kinds of people, even our enemies, in love. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Uh, We pray that as we go, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we'd be doers. God, we're walking out trusting the phrase in James that you give more grace. You give more grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen.